that he was surprised when we invited him, which, um, which I found horribly offensive, but at the same time I found that it really meant that it is the time that we do these things more often uh, and invite people like Andrew. Um, I have to thank our uh, friends and colleagues at MoMA, especially Andres Lepic. Um, Andres is the curator of contemporary architecture, um, and he has just opened a show, which all of you should go see, called Small Scale Big Change at the Museum of Modern Art, um, of which uh, Andrew is one of the 11 uh, groups that are, that are represented. Um, and I think you'll tell us a little bit about the show, will you? Um, but, uh, but I want to plug it, and uh, now he has no choice. Um, <laughs> but I want to plug it and say that, that, that everyone should go. Um, so thank you so much for coming, and uh, please give a warm welcome. Thank you, Ben. Thanks for introducing. Uh, I'm happy to have the opportunity again here to introduce another lecture uh, with, related with the show in MoMA, Small Scale, Big Change. And if you haven't seen it, then I really invite you to come and see it and uh, to see the other, the other 10 projects uh, in the show. And I th it's an extreme pleasure for me uh, to have Andrew here uh, for the lecture here in Colombia because like last year when I did the series on what is green architecture with the Goethe Institute, we had Francis Carré uh, already here and um, Francis came again this year with the um, Ecogram conference and now I think this cooperation is really working extremely well and I think, I hope I can continue like working with Colombia in this way. So, um, Andrew Freer was actually born in England and studied at the Polytechnic in London and later at the Architecture Association AA in London and moved to Alabama and he will tell us uh, more about what it is exactly, what it means to live in New Bern, Alabama later and 10 years ago, so uh, in 2000. And he was there as a, a thesis professor first when uh, Samuel Mockby was still there and still around, but soon after when Samuel Mockby, the founder of Rural Studio, he founded it in 1993, died in 2001, Andrew uh, took over at, as the director of Rural Studio. And what I find when I look back into the history of Rural Studio, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a legendary uh, design-built studio for students and has influenced so many other um, schools in America like with this program. Uh, what I find is so interesting that it was first so much related with like the figure of Samuel Mockby and then now with Andrew Freer. It has like changed in many ways uh, the shift and the direction but still is like um, so uh, so important and has um, come up with in the, in, in, in some, in the latest years with some more uh, more systematic ideas than before. So starting with like individual projects and then now uh, coming up with an idea which I found so important, the 20K house, which is in the exhibition um, because I wanted to focus on an idea that has more uh, than an impact on one family or one little community but has maybe a potential of an impact into like uh, maybe other communities and maybe other uh, countries. So this, this pedagogy of hands-on uh, is like still ongoing, uh, is, is still, still there, but it has become, in, has, has got into a new direction. Andrew um, is not only the, the director of Rural Studio and also the thesis professor, but he's also designed and supervised uh, exhibitions uh, in many cities. And I was very uh, happy that uh, like uh, Andrew who did design exhibitions was not coming up with an exhibition design for the show in MoMA because like we had this with other architects that came in uh, with their proposals and they had already the exhibition design ready how they wanted to have it uh, presented at MoMA. So uh, we had a great cooperation in that and I think um, it turned out as a great success now also in the connection with the other projects in MoMA. And uh, Andrew Freer with Rural Studio One 
I don't name the other prizes and awards, but I want to let him speak. In 2006, the Ruth and Ralph Erskine Award as a first American, and I think especially the Erskine Award is like very important because it's since the beginnings. Uh, it's an award for sustainability and social sustainability, a word that has uh, now uh, become a more um, interest in, in, in the audience. So, Andrew, please, it's yours. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm a bit of a mess tonight. I, I, all sort of dizzy and queasy or something. So, so if I if I collapse in the middle of it, just it, it'll be okay. Um, I I, um, I even I went to the restroom and realised that I'd torn a huge great hole in my shirt. So, <laughs> I, 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 Jesus, I'm just falling to bits. And then and then today, uh, ten years I think like ten years ago this year. Uh, after Mockby died, uh, the, archi the Architectural League invited me to come up here uh, to, to do a lecture. And they put me in the Hudson, and I'm in the Hudson Hotel. Thank you for the fantastic hotel. But as a, as a, as a, as a kind of peasant from the woods, it, it's just, it's frightening in there, you know. I mean, I, I, and I remember the first time going, and I couldn't figure out how to flush the toilet because it was a Philip Stark toilet. <laughs> And this time, at least they've changed the toilets out so I can flush the toilet. But you all, you all need to laugh at my jokes so I'm going to bugger off, okay? Um, um, thank, you to, thank you to MoMA, uh, uh, Andres and Margot particularly. Um, fantastic. Uh, a huge honor for us to be involved in such an exhibit with so many serious folks. And we're just kind of fooling around in the woods of West Alabama. Um, so it's really wonderful to have it legitimized in that manner. And um, also to, to, to Ben and, and Lucia for, for getting me here today. Um, any excuse to get the hell out of Hale County, you know, I'll, uh, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get out of there. Um, I don't know, can I, how do you, how do you turn, oh, well, y'all, um, uh, <laughs> This is the kind of the mythical founder of the Rural Studio program, this godlike figure. It's, it's, he's legendary. Uh, the, the things that he's done, the people that he's known, and it, it's, it's quite, a, it's quite a, an, 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 uh, it's quite a task living up to, to, to this myth. Um, and I, I knew him very differently. I, I, I lived with him for about three years and uh, saw the real guy. And, uh, he was, he was a huge amount of fun and a huge amount of energy and uh, I think about killed himself doing what he did um, and it was a huge shock to us to lose him. I hope tonight uh, um, everybody says, oh, you need to stop showing that slide and stop talking about the early work. Well, I, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing body of work. I, I hope you'll agree it's an amazing body of work. Tonight I hope that I can show you the sort of level of energy and passion that goes into the work. Um, there's an intensity to the place that I think uh, I, I delight in. It's why I live in the middle of nowhere with a bunch of 23-year-olds. It, it, uh, it's really exhilarating. Um, and I, I, I hope that I can kind of dispel, dispel a few of the myths. Um, I, I know um, I find most of the documentaries and the books and, and most of the things that have been written about the studio uh, to relative, really, they try to overly simplify it. It's a really, I, I find it an extremely complicated place and, and I, I kind of run around most of the time trying to sweep things up and tidy up the edges because it is so complicated. But um, I hope tonight I can, I can get, dispel some of those myths a little bit. I am an insider and an outsider. I've got a silly accent, but I've been there about 11 years. So I, I know it reasonably well. Um, I hope that um, what, I, what I will show you tonight is uh, some, a, a series of projects that I, that I hope are born of necessity. All of the projects that we do we're asked to get involved with. We don't, we don't helicopter them in. Um, it's not us trying to tell people how to live their lives and, and, and for me that's extremely important. Um, the work that you'll see, all the, all the physical stuff that you see tonight 
is all um, paid for by donations and grants. So if there's any rich folks out there and you, you fancy or got rich parents, I'm, I'm, I'm happy for you all to come and write me a check at the end of this. Um, um, and I hope that I can, I can also show you a little bit about the place. The people and the place are extremely important. It's why I take the luxury of taking you to Hale County a little bit at the start of this lecture. Those are the folks that have already been on this journey, forgive me, but I think it's important to just kind of reflect on the place a little bit, otherwise you'll misunderstand it. Um, I hope also it, it, it offers up a positive uh, and, cr and constructive critique on how we make architecture and how we teach and train architects. Um, I'm not, certainly not standing here tonight saying that everybody has to have a rural studio, but I think education, architectural education is going in particular directions today, and I think that we should all be aware of that and, and be part of those choices that are being made. You should be capable of defining your career path and the way that you work. And I don't think we're as aggressive and proactive as we can be. So, um, and I hope also that um, there's a little bit of a suggestion of some, some rigor. Um, I, I, um, uh, I think in the past, the sort of, the sense of mock being a few students messing around in the woods because they can, I find that quite offensive. I, I'm, I work down there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, trying to really do and figure out the right thing to do. Not what shall we do, what can we do, what could we do, but what is the right thing to do. And so we take it really, really seriously. Um, I, um, I'm going to uh, just read a few things at the beginning of this because there's always some grown-up stuff that I always forget to talk about. So uh, just as a kind of an introduction. And I'm going to try and get through it as quickly as possible. So you all, because I was warned that you York, New Yorkers don't have a very long attention span and that you all might walk, walk out. So I'm going to keep it fast and entertaining, hopefully. <laughs> um, OK, so uh, this is Mockby, big fat white guy from Mississippi with the uh, unpolitically correct nickname. Um, Rural Studio is an undergraduate educational program, and it's part of the five-year Bachelor of Architecture at Auburn University. Now in its 17 year, 17th year, it was set up by D.K. Ruth and, and Samuel Mockby as a response to two things. First of all was a desire to have a more hands-on approach for architecture students. And second, there was an, there was an interest in, def, in looking at the definitive rural house. Um, just very quickly, so you all know where I've come from today, uh, this, is, this is the sort of the deep south. You all are up there somewhere. Um, we're, we're, we actually are right about here. Uh, at the bottom end of the Appalachian Mountain Trail, okay, and that, what's interesting about that is that it, um, we also inhabit an area called the Black Belt, and uh, that, the, the Black, it's called the Black Belt, cost, not because there's a whole bunch of black folks living there, but because of the type of soil that emanates through that area, and it's actually because of the Appalachian, this uh, Appalachian Mountain uh, formation, huh? Range, yeah, range, range will do. Sorry, I'm losing it. Are you all intimidating me? Because Columbia is such a famous place, you know. Yeah. Um, so uh, lots of this red clay stuff comes through here, and so it's called the Black Belt, right? You got that. Um, and uh, a couple of things to think about, and, and uh, you know, first and foremost, this fantastic map, which. Uh, shows you that Alabama screwed up at some point in the very, re very near past, got rid of their most, you know, valuable piece of real estate along the way. I mean, you know, somebody needs their head seeing too. But, um, just, to, just to take you there, so there's a, there's a civil rights triangle of Birmingham, Selma, and Montgomery. We're in a place called New Bern, which is West Alabama, a uh, town of about 200, 230 people when the student's there. The university's over here on the east side. Um, the civil rights triangle we have to deal with every day. I mean, it's, an, it's a matter of fact of, of our everyday existence. It's a, it's a very potent and emotional issue for everybody. Um, we, can, we can talk all night about the impact that that ha has on our students. I think what's nice from my point of view is that the students don't bring baggage to this discussion. They're willing to work with anybody. And it, what happens in these sorts of places is there are an awful lot of sort of entrenched 
opinions and baggage that stops people actually doing things, right? So our students bring in uh, almost uh, an innocence, yes, but a willingness to work with everybody, which I think is really important. The other thing to say is that it's, it's, if you're thinking of setting up a rural studio, um, which some of you might be, uh, what's interesting about this map is that New Bern's over here and Auburn's over here, and it's a three-hour drive. So essentially what that means is that there's this sort of three-hour distance between all those folks at a university that are determined to stop you doing, having any fun at all. You know, they're, they're kind of provosts and vice chancellors and deans and presidents, all those lot. If they get in their car, we've got at least got three hours to clear up all the mess, you know? Um, come on, y'all. Wakey, wakey. Um, um, okay, so... Um, this is, uh, uh, this is the, the chosen location, Hale County in West Alabama. Um, and it was an, al an area that was very well documented by James a Agee in the 1930s. This is actually Main Street, Greensboro, circa 1930s. And if you look at an image of Greensboro today, there's actually not an awful lot of difference. You know, the, 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 there's a slightly newer Volvo on the street and a coat of paint down and, and, a, and, a, and a painted yellow stripe, but m life moves very, very slowly. Similarly, um, this is a uh, sharecropper's home, again, circa 1930s, uh, 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 a Walker Evans photograph again, and this is Mason's Bend today. And, and again, uh, if I think what, um, if Samuel Mockby was here and sort of legitimizing this show and this conversation because of his deep southern drawl rather than my stupid English accent with the occasional y'all. He, he was profound, profoundly offended by what he found in West Alabama. Um, the, the, the Hale County population is 16,000. Is 16, Out of that population, 36% live below the poverty line and a really extraordinary 45% of children are below the poverty line. And that doesn't take me as a European with a silly accent and who says y'all to, to um, sort of just find that extraordinary in, in, a, in, in this kind of society, country and, and with so, so much wealth and so much richness that you have that in your, your own backyard. And again, uh, I, it's, you know, point made, I guess. Um, it's also a beautiful faith-based place and uh, religion is absolutely everywhere. Um, come on, y'all are slow at reading. Um, there's also um, great evidence of the old, old white wealth, the cotton wealth, but there's also this incredible poverty which can, can just look like, you know, the archetypal images of Soweto or Johannesburg or wherever we expect those images to come from. What's changed a little bit today, even in the 10 years that I've been there, is that this kind of poverty has disappeared, and it's disappeared behind the face, uh, the facelessness of trailer homes, really crappily designed and crappily built trailer homes. So there's less of the kind of shanty and shack and dirt floor, but it's still there, it's just evolved slightly. Um, also in fantastic, incredible dignity. I mean, this is Alberta Harris, Alberta Bryant. Um, this is uh, the client for the first house the Royal Studio ever built, a phenomenal lady. and. I love this photograph. This is a kind of classic Tim Hursley photograph. Shepard Bryant turns his back on Tim and says, I'm not, you're not photographing me, pal. And then an Alberta, Tim captured this. Now, Alberta has lost, um, had lost both of her limbs because of diabetes. And when I first met her, what I loved about Alberta was finding her, and she would, she would have her hand around her prosthetic leg and she'd wave it around at the nephews and nieces who were walking in and out. It was like, it was the, it was the control stick or device to control her kids, right? Um, just so fantastic dignity. I mean, you could be really angry and really disappointed at the world, but not at all. The most delightful, lovely lady. And she actually died three weeks ago, sadly enough. But, um, so it's... Um, it's a, uh, since the demise of cotton, it's a landscape that barely sustains the logging industry and uh, more recently the catfish industry. Um, what's interesting about this, and uh, this, is, this is actually an area of ponds very close to Newburn where I live, 
the same uh, red clay dirt that they used to purvey cotton on, you can actually dig a hole in that dirt and you don't have to line it out and you can actually th put water in there and then they, they throw a bunch of catfish in there. So it's the, the dairy farmers are really diversifying into that because they're not making enough money in the dairy. You see the beautiful red clay, uh, but they're really trying to figure out a way to make a living. And ironically enough, that red clay is very, very difficult for us to, to build on because it's expansive. It expands and contracts. So if you ever want to do a concrete slab, you've got to super thicken it or you've got to super reinforce it. Um, um, the, and, and again, this is, uh, this is what is this balanced with uh, the, the, the dairy farming is a sort of the predominant way to make a living down there at the moment. It's also a really beautiful place, I have to say. And, you know, the evidence, uh, this is uh, on a place called Folsom, a beautiful old plantation. Uh, real evidence here of the sort of African carpentry. Uh, uh, just, you know, as an architect, you're just going to die for this. There's beautiful cantilever here, the big overhang, sensibly big roof, lift the building off the ground, and the thing's been here 130 years, you know. So we look at those sorts of things every day, but this is, I, I think, a beautiful piece of architecture. It's also a society that has a rest on Sunday, unlike, unlike even me and y'all. It's, it's, uh, it's nice to see people have some respect for each other to um, get dressed up, to take a deep breath, whether it's for spiritual reasons or whatever, but at least they say, okay, we're going to have a day with the family today and we're gonna, it's not going to be 24 hours, seven days a week. And I somewhat, I somewhat like that. Um, and this is, uh, th this is a guy called Jim Witherspoon. This is a 14-point bookhead. This is what they call sport in West Alabama. I don't know whether you all consider it sport, but he was so proud of this image that he put this up inside the gas station in, in, uh, in Greensboro as a kind of a trophy, not, not the thing itself, but the photograph, right? So I stole the photograph. But um, um, again, uh, great cultural differences. I mean, this is what he does to relax. That's not what I do to relax. Um, so you go, you go you, this is the sort of landscape that you find in West Alabama. Uh, lots of deforestation. One of the issues that Alabama has is that the, it's predominantly owned by people who don't live there. Um, when you want, to, and, and they're very powerful people, people that um, are, import, for example, involved in the newspaper industry. So um, the taxation is extremely low there. If you ever want to do anything about health or education, and you suggest rising it even a quarter, raising it even by a quarter of percent, they start to lobby and frighten everybody that the end of the world is nigh if you if you pay a few dollars on sales tax or even on real estate tax. So. It's a really vicious circle. Um, poor education uh, leads to really poor decision making locally, and it's it's a it's a tough it's a tough uh, thing to beat. And then, you know, this is sort of low to middle income housing, not quite as bad as this, but it, it it's sort of indicative of how long these things last. Uh, you, it's real. I mean, it's this is a sort of American genius, quite frankly. You can, you can go to one of these lots, you can buy one of these things, put a down payment on it, and next day it's delivered and you get your dream home. The problem is that you're paying through the nose, uh, you're paying really exorbitant interest rates on it, but you get your dream home the next day, right? So it's instant architecture. And so as architects, it's very difficult to beat that. But the problem is that these things have fallen into the ground 25 years later and they've probably paid three or four times what the, their value is. So it's very sad and really quite exploitative. Um, so this, uh, this is Mockby on Main Street in New Bern. I, I would suggest those sort of three fundamental things that the kids, the students, get out of this experience. One is a sort of a, a, a very clear exposure to the sort of arts and crafts tradition of architecture, the, the, like the connection between drawing and making, an understanding of the kind of the implications of the drawn line. The other is um, an immersion in a very, very small rural community that's full of gossip and everybody knows what everybody else is doing. So there's an intensity to that. And then on top of that, they also have to work in teams. And I think it's, uh, you know, I. I Hope that's why we all exist, to kind of work with each other, play with each other, be with each other. 
And um, I, I, I think that we don't really give them any lessons in how to work together. They just sort of get together like cats and start to fight and then begin to figure it out. But I think it's a fantastically important part of their education that it is all team building. Uh, this is the world headquarters of the Rural Studio, the Morissette House. This is where the third year students live. These are called the pods. These are, the studio had to build this at its beginning to give accommodation to the younger students because they were already paying rent on the main campus. So very pragmatic. On the other hand, they're, they're, they're built, these are the sort of the first thesis projects. So this is architecture students who are getting the chance to build. And my goodness, I've been at architecture school four years and I'm gonna just show you everything I've learned. And so they, they literally vomit it, you know. Um, I mean, it's, it's got every trick and every gizmo in the book. Um, they're beautiful. They're beautiful little uh, dwellings. Uh, don't get me wrong, but I think, uh, you know, they, they are what they are. Um, and it's, it's the, the sort of classic, hopefully the kind of classic live-work environment. Um, you, you are... But I hope that people take care of it. I think that um, there's, there's a, 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 a hopefully a culture of, of, of loving where you live and also taking care of it. This is, this is some, in, in the, you know, certainly in the beginning there was a, a reputation and, and a, again a characterization of the Royal Studio as the great scavengers and recyclers. This is a sort of classic example that Mockby was very proud of. This is reversed Hale County license plates making the cladding for uh, what he called the shitter, the composting toilet down in, um, in Newburn. And he always accused, actually, uh, Frank Gehry of stealing this idea for the Guggenheim <laughs> Museum. So, um, this is where I used to live. This is a very early photograph of me. Um, but uh, we were given this building. Um, well, actually, we bought it for $3,000. That's nearly given, I suppose. This is what it looks like today. My young staff live in this. So we've got a series of buildings discreetly tucked into New Bern. We're not trying to be Martha, Texas or anything like that. I hope New Bern is New Bern. It's not kind of rural studio Disneyland, but we have to try and be as discreet as we possibly can be. Um, and then this is downtown New Bern. Um, yes, uh, this, <laughs> this is where the students design all together. Um, this is the great red barn that we took over in 2001. And the, the, uh, the owner said, yo, yeah, I'd love you to use it, but you, you really, I, and you know, clearly he was frightened of what the heck we might do to it, cover it with flying sticks or something. And um, uh, he said, you can't, please don't touch the outside. I said, you're joking, man, it's beautiful. Why would we change it? So we've sort of changed it inside, um, although we didn't need to change it inside upstairs and, and inhabited it. And so it's right in downtown. Nobody else would use that building. People wandering off the streets come and see what we're doing. And it, it feels like we're helping Newburn have a little bit of a center, reinforcing the, the, town, the, the post office and GB Woods uh, grocery store. Uh, this is Frances Sullivan, who call, calls herself the postmaster, not the postmistress. She looks um, after a number of our kids and really has grown incredibly close to all of our students as they go through each year. And this is, uh, this is Henry, who unfortunately is, has had to just recently move into um, sheltered housing. He did live across the road from us, but I always enjoyed this photograph because I was really intrigued by his diet of orange juice and Colt 45. But, um, and so as a teacher, you get to, you really don't know what you're going to face each day. Um, it's... Uh, I can be help raising some steel. I can also be working in the cold in the red barn, uh, sketching on the wall. Um, there's, we've, we've done a lot with the building, and I think somebody in the audience is in this photograph, maybe, maybe somewhere. Um, uh, we've, this, is, this is sort of our design space. Um, it's terribly hot in summer and terribly cold in winter. It's sort of a, we don't want it to be like Auburn, we don't want it to be like the Easy Design Studio, but I, it's probably getting slightly ridiculous at the moment. It, 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 it needs a little TLC, but it's a lovely place to design and work. We've been very lucky over the last um, at least 10 years, really since Mockby died, to have a series of guys and gals who um, have become our consultants and we're really our go-to guys, all pro, no, pro bono work, engineers from 
New York and Chicago and London, uh, environmental engineers, really smart guys who come and help us because they love it. Um, and so I can rely on them as a sort of extended teaching arm, if you like, because there aren't any resources to teach, uh, to, to bring more teachers and professors in. Um, these, are, these are the most important guys at the Royal Studio, the, the prison labor that we have. This used to be my, my office. Um, <laughs> I now have a really kind of wussy Honda Fit, you know, that's all politically correct and really small and fuel efficient. And I just, you know, it, this thing just died, but it was, it was a brute. And I really enjoyed being macho in it, you know. <laughs> now I feel, I feel emasculated now, you know. So <laughs> anyway, and, and we, have these, the, we have inmates from the local prison camp that come out and help work on our property. And uh, honestly, they're much more interesting than the students, quite honestly. So, so oh, 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 oh. <laughs> come on, wake up. Um, projects are, and um, I, I think the kind of lousy title that I gave to the talk tonight, a local architect or something, it, it, um, all of the projects you'll see tonight are within a 25-mile radius of Newburn. Um, really, from a very practical point of view, how do you manage this stuff? How do you travel the least? Um, so we work, we're working in four and five counties. Um, as a sort of a summary of, 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 uh, of, of who's at the studio, we're typically running at about 32 students officially, 44 unofficially, because we have these thesis students who agree to come for two semesters and actually end up staying from 12 months to two years to do these um, probably slightly heroic bigger community projects. So there's uh, 12 to 16 uh, uh, younger students. Typically they've done a charity home that's been tried to, uh, completed in about a year. We've got typically three to four uh, public, pretty major public projects going on at the same time. And then we've got the outreachers at the moment working on the 20K house. And they're a group of students that we want to supplement the Auburn community with, our community of architects, with a little bit of life, a little bit of foreignness, you know, somebody else that we don't know anything about. So um, I don't know if that, uh, and this is, this is a certificate program. Anybody from outside Auburn can apply to this and come and be part of the Royal Studio, typically three to four students. Um, and, you know, that in the history of, I always like this photograph because it implies, you know, democracy and cooperation and conversation. Um, um, uh, you know, in the, in the history of the studio, obviously, the, the, essentially the program sort of made its name by doing single family homes. The students do indeed get to design these things and build them. Um, they work with the clients and they really try to um, understand what it is that the client really needs. Uh, through models or three-dimensional work. I mean, obviously, these folks have ne really never spoken to an architect before, have no idea what they're even talking about. But, um, and then the luxury of it all is that, um, and probably unlike anything that you could do in New York City, but they really do get to jump on the backhoe and put the, put the, put the plumbing in and put the roof on and put the electric in and all of that stuff. So there's a fantastic experience that they, they get there just to lift that two by four and understand how heavy it is. To lift that four by eight sheet of plywood and understand how difficult it is for the tradesman to put it in the house. It's, it's really important. Um, so, you know, um, from the beginning, I think, you know, Samuel Mockby was probably smart enough to know that at least initially he needed to get some work out there that was really good and that people would acknowledge as being good. And I think uh, uh, frankly, I think Sambo's name is all over the, uh, is, his hand is all over this. This is the first house that the studio did uh, for Alberta and Shep that I showed you earlier. Kind of classic southern porch, uh, the straw bale infill, the little wagon wheels on the back to accept the extended family. Uh, terrific relationship with the client, but the client lives with it not as if, as if it's a piece of artwork. It is, you know, it's their home. There's the detritus of everyday life and a phenomenal relationship evolved between uh, Sambo and the, and, 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 these, and the two clients. I mean, to just, you, you could not believe it um, that in, in this part of Alabama that, that I mean, I, I remember 
her stories of, you know, why is this white guy? I don't believe this white guy. He's, he's not really going to come and build us a house. And, and so, um, and uh, we, living there and being part of that community, what's allowed us to do is things like this. This is, uh, this is 18 months ago. Uh, we went back. Um, the, the, the two elderly folks that were living here had really not been able to look after it. And so we went back. We threw all of the studio at the house. And uh, we just gave it a good old cleaning and a coat of paint and tipped it upside down. And now the granddaughter of Alberta and Shep is living in it. So I, I you know, it's, um, it's, a, it, it's a good feeling to know that, that somebody else is making use of that and that it's not falling into the ground. And it's not just a good feeling, but I think it, uh, um, they, they were not, you know, because of their age, they simply weren't able to, to give it the TLC that it deserved. More recently, um, in, in terms of the studio, uh, was our, th our third year students have been looking at the single family house. There's some question in the studio at the moment as to what exactly the third year should be looking at. Um, but um, about 18 months ago, we completed this house, which was a, a different type of model from the porch, the, 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 the classic southern porch. It is a porch house, but it's also a study of a courtyard house. Uh, this is, a, uh, is a, what we call it. The cedar house, it's totally and utterly wrapped maniacally in, in, uh, in sort of one by two cedar um, with this great public porch. And there's Rosalie Turner sitting on the front porch because she loves, she's a very social lady. Um, this is the, 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 the courtyard that we made uh, with these vertical cedar slats so that there was some privacy. And then when you were in certain angles, you could see through it to be able to communicate with her neighbor and cedar laid into a concrete backyard because she said, I don't want any, you know, I don't want any lawn to mow. You know, give me some concrete back there. So um, that's why the surface is as hard as it is. And then that's the interior. And all of the wood was scavenged from a barn. We, the students took a fantastic barn down that was donated to us. And all of, the, all of the sheathing and the trusses that you see were made of an old barn and the floor. So uh, a, a, quite a, 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 a nice house, I think. Um, and of course, the, the nice house, Jesus. You don't say nice house, do you, at, at Columbia? <laughs> Fuck. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, and, uh, you, you know, also the reputation of the studio for taking sort of recycled and found materials, uh, 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 rightly or wrongly, used as an opportunity for a number of the houses. This is... Uh, this is um, Carpet, uh, we, uh, we were invited by Interface to build an exhibition. Um, they came to us and said, uh, we want you to use some cardboard bales. The image that you've got on the poster tonight, we want to use some cardboard bales to, to, to exhibit some of our work and talk, some of the Royal Studio work and talk about some of your work. And we're like, what the hell has carpet got to do with it? Sorry, has cardboard got to do with this? So um, we, uh, we called them up and said, send us some of your, your cast-offs from the carpet. And uh, this is what they sent us, these fantastic, huge, great bales of, of yarn that are actually used for dashboards on automobiles. So it's, the, it's the furry stuff that you find on a dashboard if you've ever torn your dashboard off to have a look on the other side of it. It's for insulation. So I spent my summer with my head in a trash compactor making these kind of big, fluffy dog things, like the size of a straw bale. And, and then we stacked them and made this 22-inch uh, solid wall of yarn and uh, inserted these metal frames into it to display the models. And then as a result of that, Mockby sort of captured their attention and said, go on, y'all, give us some money so we can build a house and we'll build it out of carpet. And the, the challenge was, could we build a house out of carpet? Probably not with the yarn, because, of course, you know, that would be silly. But we... Uh, <laughs> uh, but we, we got sillier and we decided to build it out of, of, of tile. And these, tile, these carpet tiles are the conventional tile that often used into institutionally in a place like this. Maybe not this stuff, but these, these were seconds. They had off gas for seven years. They were very clean. They sat in a warehouse. Nobody knew what to do with them. And so we took, um, we essentially took 72,000 of them and stacked them one on top of the other and built a house for Lucy. And, uh, 
sat a ring beam all the way around the top of the wall and tightened it down and then attached the roof to that. So there actually is a, there are columns going up through the wall. We didn't expect that the wall would support the roof, but uh, there's sort of a, a, a safety issue for that, of course. Um, and then um, that's how the house ended up looking. It was an interesting house because it, it started off in the lifetime of Sambo and then Sambo died sort of at Christmas and, and the, the sort of the team split a little bit and, um, and you can never guess that one team was over here and the other team was over here and it, it, it got, I would suggest it got a tad competitive so, uh, you know, uh, and it lost its screened in porch which I don't think Mockby would have allowed them to do but it's a really interesting house. Um, they love it. It's really changed their lives totally. This guy, AJ, his personality and performance at school has gone through the roof. This is a family that used to live in one, two rooms, right? And they're a big family in more ways than one, you know? So the problem is something like this is that you, um, you give them, you work with them on this house, right? And then what do they do? They run off and they go to the, the furniture guy, the local furniture guy who allows them to take this furniture on the Never Never. So they, they fill the house with the most ridiculously expensive furniture because this is what they're, they're all sitting on in daytime TV or something, you know. So, um, so they put themselves in debt after you've tried to help them out of it. So, so and of course, it, allows, it allowed us to kind of access to those kinds of communities. Uh, at the same time, with the material exploration, uh, formally the student studio started to, um, and I don't know whether it was by accident or not, but again in this sort of process of scavenging, a couple of really, uh, I mean, very well known and remarkable pieces came out. The glass chapel in Mason's Bend, made of uh, windshields, scavenged from Chicago. Uh, uh, and, and established as a kind of fish skin sitting on the top of the, the round earth wall. Really beautiful, but it, it, it's, it's sad because it's, it's in a community that doesn't know how to look after the building and it's really a kind of a, it's a difficult one for the studio to live with because the kids locally trash it and there's nobody there willing to kind of take it over because the person that owned the land has died and it's, you know, what do you do? Do you, do you I don't know pick it up and bring it to MoMA, what do you do with this thing? Because when people come and visit this, they're pissed off at the people locally because they don't think they care about it. And the people who are local are too busy trying to survive, you know, worrying about whether or not the windshields are dirty, you know, so. Um, but, and at the same time, well, a little bit earlier was the, the really remarkable um, uh, Yancey Tire Chapel made out of 900 uh, rammed uh, uh, stacked and filled with dirt uh, tires covered in pink concrete. I mean a remarkably mature piece but also a piece that was built on private property and um, so now the problem is that the owner died. You know when you're starting a program like this I guess you choose your battles, you jump in bed with some people that you don't end up you know don't end up coming through. This is built on private property People, people, because of the person that was working with us at the time died, somebody else inherited it, and so now nobody can go and see this. And this is a really huge shame because it's a, it's a phenomenal piece. The, 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 the pulpit actually sort of hangs over a, a, a sort of a ravine. So when, you're, when the uh, preacher is in the pulpit here, it's as if he's sort of standing in midair. I mean, it's just a phenomenal piece of architecture. This is the view uh, back. Um, so really since um, Samuel Mockby died, we've had a, a remarkable number of requests to get involved with projects. I think we've also taken on and off a sort of a different form of recycling. It's not the sort of uh, license plates, tires, what can you do with this pile of stuff? It's, well, how can we save this building? And in this case, we came and looked at this building and we, we ummed and aahed about it and ultimately we tore it down and said what we'll do with this one is we'll take this down, we'll take it down piece by piece and we ended up using 75% of it in the new building. So we took the time and the care, we even built them a little, um, what do you call it, a little chapel because if you imagine you tear someone's church down, they're going to go somewhere else. So we needed to make them a little chapel where they could come and have their Sunday services together so that when they're church was being rebuilt, 
that they had somewhere to go. But this was all us taking the time and the care and the attention for them to understand that all of that material was being regenerated into a new church. Um, the church was moved up closer to the cemetery. Uh, you can see the cemetery reflected in the windows. And, and so this is, the, this is the feeling that you get when you're sitting in the, the, the nave of the church. Here's the, an, um, the graveyard, and it's, it's, um, there's <laughs> and this relationship really, I mean, you know where you're going to end up when you're sitting in this place. You know. um, this is a fantastic image. Uh, these, these, these guys, uh, again, um, uh, this is, this is the, again, the reuse of a building that probably nobody else would have done. This is a, a, an abandoned school building. Uh, a, a group called the Rural Heritage Foundation wanted to occupy this. We found that they had $190,000 they were actually going to, I think, get ripped off. And what we ended up doing was, was a really two and a half phase project. We gave them a big old sign because it was, it was set back from a main road, so it needed to wave its arms a little bit. Uh, we made them a stage. So it's a, it's a celebration of rural heritage, and particularly the heritage of rural West Alabama. There's a big pepper, um, a pepper, jelly, eating, a pepper jelly festival in, in which they have uh, watermelon eating contests. And they even have the Alabama Elvis shows up. Um, and we, we put in, a, a, ironically enough, in their program that they had got this money for, they didn't have a gift shop. And it was like, well, how are you all going to survive? You haven't got anywhere to sell your stuff. And so we were able, this was actually the first piece we did. We inserted the kind of Miesian glass box into the old school building, gave them a pepper jelly display wall that they could walk around. And this is in the sunset in the evening. It's a really fantastic color that comes through here. Idea was stolen from Marlon Blackwell a little bit um, from his beehive thing, but this is damn sight better. Um, there you go. And, and it's why Mesian? Well, because all of that folk art stuff is just, it's, it's, I mean, it's noisy and colorful and all over the place. So you don't need to fight that. Um, we worked with Hero to. Uh, take this old dilapidated storefront and turn it into this. This is all donated glass, donated Pella windows, just a kind of a loft, a very simple stripping out of the existing building. Uh, don't build too many new walls in there because their program may change. Uh, we worked with the local schools. Uh, Perry County Board of Education had nowhere for the bad kids to go to, so they were deliberately getting expelled so they could go home. And, um, so we turned this into this, uh, and, and just uh, it was a very simple essay in sort of a plywood module. Uh, we, one of the most successful we've done is a senior center in Akron. Turned this into this. Um, uh, again, reuse of buildings that probably nobody else would bother with. They probably just tear them around, tear them down. This is Greensboro, um, our county seat, the, the kind of the capital of Hale County. Uh, Ironically enough, they had, they had had an L-shaped hospital and the architect, the brilliant architect, uh, put an, an extension on the L-shape and came almost, he didn't complete the donut, right? So they couldn't go all the way around without going outside and it's like, you didn't complete the donut, you know, why, why didn't you make the courtyard? So, so we made the courtyard and uh, put, essentially put a, a and, you know, we weren't able to touch the, the walls or for a variety of legal reasons, but we certainly made a place that the staff and the patients can come and enjoy and a covered walkway to connect the, the complete circle. Whoops, oh, you can't miss these guys. These guys, uh, sensibly enough, decided to work with Newburn and build a fire station come town hall. Um, this guy's in the audience tonight. Um, uh, I mean, just a big shoulders, civic project, the first building in Newburn for 110 years. Wow, it's got to be good. Um, convinced them that the pattern of Newburn was very urban, although it's, you know, it's, it's a very rural place. So push the fire station up to the street, uh, celebrate those fire trucks. You can see how urban the rest of these are right up at the street edge. So we followed that pattern. Uh, two guys and two girls built this in, in uh, around two years. Uh, that's Will Brothers. I don't know if Leia's in this, but uh, 
Uh, and then we had a fantastic opening and all of New Bern and just about all of West Alabama showed up. And, and we had, we had <laughs> it's, I never forget this, they, we had decided at 6.30 at night to have the fire trucks turn their lights on and, and the sirens were going to go off and then we would lift the front, the, the front door would go up and they'd come out and everybody would cheer. And what happened was the front door came up to about here and it got stuck. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and all you could see were the students like, like moving around and going, fuck, 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 fuck. <laughs> and anyway, so uh, it was, it's the one thing you've got to get right on a firehouse, really, isn't it? Uh, but it was actually the one thing we didn't build. So, um, but it's, uh, it's, this is a big south-facing wall that's covered in polygal and, and then cedar slats. So the high summer sun is controlled by the cedar slats, low winter sun allows it to get in there, stop the fire trucks freezing, heat up the concrete floor, no insulation, yada, yada, yada. But a, but a very, I mean, it's, uh, it's, New Bern's very proud of it, we're proud of it. it uh, and then it's, it's moved on from these sort of bigger um, community projects to some projects that have got some structural thought behind it or more rational structural thought or more deliberate structural thought. This is called a, a lamella structure kind of beginning to have a dialogue locally as to how you could build long span structures without using steel so much. So this is all built using a jig. This is all two by sixes, uh, standard dimension lumber that you can get at your local uh, supply store. And you just bolt the whole thing together. And you build it on top of that jig. The jig wheels down the grade beams. You build a section at a time. So you, you, you build the concrete grade beams. You wheel the jig into it. You build on top of it this amount, right, and then you lower it, you move it along, lift it up, build it again, yada, yada, yada. So you could build it to Mississippi. Um, and this is the Hale County Animal Shelter. Um, I mean, <laughs> uh, naturally ventilated, underfloor heating, fantastic partnership with the county. Um, and then we took that idea, I said to them, look, that jig cost us so much money, we've got to use it again. So I said, we can do the Boys and Girls Club in Akron if we use the jig. So I forced them to use the jig. So the Boys and Girls Club in Akron has, has a slightly distorted lamella that almost looks as if it's falling down. But we rolled it over. So this is the lamella from this point down to here, literally tipped over on its side. And what it does is it allows you to play basketball in there. So it lifted it up and rolled it. And this, lot, this thing here is just a big old box that essentially is the shear wall for that thing to stop it falling over, you know. So, um, and it, well, it, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but it deals with the buckling. <laughs> it deals with the buckling in these columns, okay? And that's a big old structural gutter, which is really cool. Um, so this is the basketball, that's the entrance. This is a basketball court, that's the entrance. This is at night. This is the kids are opening. It's, it's up and running now. We're all very proud of it. Uh, this was the opening party with the mayor. Um, we've had a series of park projects that have allowed us to kind of do a, projects as phases. So how can you do a big project but in a series of small phases? This is Perry Lakes Park, the, the poorest county in our part of West Alabama. They got $110,000 to, to open a park. Uh, they asked us to be their project architect. So this is a kind of process that the students go through, just like you all do. Bring the site to the studio. It's kind of three-dimensional stuff so they can communicate with each other. Lots of models, um, physical modeling. Then you get out on site and you test something and you say, well, how, you know, I'm suggesting it's 30 feet high. What the hell does that look like in this space? So as the architect, that's a huge privilege to go to the site and test it and be on site 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Understand the, um, the, uh, the climate. Uh, lots of details. The studio is accused of not doing it very much of this. We do a terrific amount of this so we don't waste money. Then we make mock-ups of them to test them. We do not very kind of Columbia-looking <laughs> renderings. Um, no blobbies in here at all. It's just trees look like trees. Um, and then... Um, <laughs> Uh, then Steve Bedanes comes at Christmas and he says, what the hell are you doing? Why are you putting it here? And we have our reviews on site. And then they get to present to their client. And this is where we rehearse, we re rehearse religiously. Because if what comes out of your mouth it is ridiculous, it really doesn't matter how good those drawings are. 
How do you orchestrate that room? How do you communicate with them? How do you make sure they're close enough to it to understand it so you haven't wasted your time? It's fantastic. Uh, this is a, an amazing kind of client body of, of, of uh, probate judge and mayor and uh, county engineer and all sorts of folks. Then you get yourselves on the front of the local newspaper to kind of... Uh, uh, they, they were after getting cedar donated, so they got some cedar trees donated. Then they went in the ground. They, we uh, used the bark from when we milled the trees. They used all of the bark on the inside of the formwork for the footings. So when you take the formwork off, the bark residue is left on the, on the footings. And then you, then you stand there and watch as the local contractor puts the, the heavy stuff up. And then you say, well, shit, this is 32 feet up in the air. Um, and the Royal Studio, of course, insists on, on no hard hats or safety equipment. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, fantastic discussions about the process of building. You know, if you're going to, if you want to put metal on here, do you need to put plywood under here to, to uh, secure that metal too so it doesn't oil can? How are you going to do that? Is it, you know, and if you're going to put plywood on the underside of there, it's sort of reverse of the process. You really want to always be building on top. So um, uh, they agreed to put the plywood up. It does buckle, but I think it, uh, in, in the manner that it buckles, it gives off a very beautiful light. So they, 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 the mayor came to the opening. The, the, the kind of reflected indirect light is fantastic. Uh, you, you can see they were put up, and here's the kind of buckling that I'm talking about, that they liked that. So, and then the, the sort of the cedar platform wraps up and over. So there's two um, planes that float. This is the kissing bench. Uh, these two guys were caught kissing. Um, and then this is our four students saying that Andrus is the number one curator in the entire world. Um, and then uh, Hurricane Ivan hit. And uh, unfortunately, this big old baby here went right through there and smashed the end of it. Uh, we got $10,000 to rebuild it from FEMA, though. So. And then we were asked to build restrooms, and they, they liked the pavilion so much, they said, don't, don't, we won't spend it on that $50,000 on a prefabricated restroom. We want you to build it. So we did four rest, three restrooms, uh, the three most ridiculous pooping experiences in, in <laughs> the United States of America. There's a tall toilet, the mound toilet, and the long toilet. This is the view from the John in the tall toilet. Uh, then there's the, mount, the, the long toilet, with these two arms going out that go out and they grab this tree so you can sit and look at the tree when you're on the john. And then this is the Sahar Hadid mound toilet. Uh, you get this very nice horizontal sh and you can sit there and imagine shooting Zahar as she runs across. Um, and then, uh, so they asked, we, we sort of were running out of money and we brought money to the table to uh, build this bridge because they wanted us to build a birding tower and uh, in another part of the park, but we had to get across a creek to get to the building, the birding tower. So we built this sort of hanging bridge. It's a, it's a very kind of clear, here's the structural support, here's the tie downs, these are in cantilever, this sits here like the kind of St. Louis arch. And really that's what was built. Um, the sorts of drawings that we do with our, our consultants, then we built it up the road from, the, from where it was gonna be sited we put it on trailer axles. The uh, then that's the old geezer here running down the road trying to hold the, the structure up off the floor to stop it bouncing on the ground. And you imagine with that, that truss is going through much more stress than, than it would in any situation when it's actually in position. And then they got this crane donated for the weekend, lifted it all into place, uh, and then put a roof over the top of it. Whoop, there you go. So there it sits. And that takes you to the tower, which, you know, uh, they had wanted a birding tower. And uh, some smart ass said to us, why don't you go and get one of those fire towers? Because the de decommissioning all those fire towers was one of those moments. And so the kids ran off and got this donated for, I think, like $10. But the, that was the, the, the crux of the problem was, and, and that was my oh shit moment, because I suddenly realized that they'd have to take it down and build it. And so the pro project became a reality. Um, so we, 
and my, my prerequisite was to them, you've got to go off and get the, the most, the, you, you've got to go off and get certified as tower erectors and deconstructors. And of course, lo and behold, they did. And they, they learned on the tower. They took the tower down. And uh, they took it away and had it, piece by piece, had it regalvanized, had safety training. But they, they started at the top and took it down. They didn't learn from the ground and, you know, um, and so they're all very sort of macho. But it, we, um, we put it into the ground with helical anchors, uh, no concrete. Uh, they did this all themselves, built this beautiful boardwalk that floats up to it, and then you see these great views, and then you find the tower. And so they rebuilt the tower, and the, the helical anchors allowed them to put it right next to the ecotone. Uh, they did fantastic handrails, new handrails, enclosures, but the positioning, it was all about the positioning of this thing. That's the architecture of this thing. Um, and then these amazing views, 100, 100 feet up over the swamp. Uh, you can look out over that landscape. And there it disappears into the, and am I okay? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, as a result of that experience of this kind of one project after another, it enabled us to say yes to um, Lions Park. The local community established a committee with all sorts of cast of characters on this committee. Um, but it, they came to us in 2005 and said, can you help us remake our, our uh, park? It's been done in an ad hoc manner. We think it can be much better. Um, so we have sort of, to this day, we have numerous community meetings. This is what the park looked like. Uh, sort of a lot of it had fallen into disrepair. All of the home plates were in different places, so there was no genius loci. So the initial thing we did was, I'm sorry about the projection, but we turned it into a hub and spoke. So the first stage was six ball fields with a hub and spoke around a pavilion, which is an existing pavilion. Keep the cars out of the park. Let's have some discipline, uh, area photographs of it. And so the first stage was these backstops and the regrading of the fields. The, the students took down the existing, got some more donated, ended up getting $100,000 from Baseball Tomorrow to do all the backstops and a lot of the work. So we, we did new trash can containers, new benches, new backstops, um, all of this stuff so you can hit it with a baseball bat and you can't break it. Um, graphic lines in the landscape to camouflage water and electrical connections. Um, and also to, to try and give the landscape just a little bit of three-dimensionality or light, life, new, new, new gates that the people are kind of falling in love with. They come and get themselves photographs, all sorts of folks from the community enjoying the gates. Uh, we built them restrooms um, that take the water off the roof. Um, so the water is all, these, are, these culverts are all connected together. The water rises inside it, and it, it's the brown water flushes the toilets, which are inside these um, uh, poured in place, um, what do they call it, tilt up concrete panels. So there's a tilt up concrete panel restrooms, all pressurized by the water from the roof, pressurizing the system. Prison toilets. Um, next step was make a, make a new space in the park because it was very successful, so we needed some more room. Um, we wanted a concession stand, and we were playing with this idea of having a mouth that you bought food out of. And, and we couldn't figure out, we had this mouth like this, and we couldn't figure out how to do this stuff. And my plumber friend showed up from Chicago, and he said, y'all, why don't you just make it move? And we're all sat there like, oh shit, you're right. So, so it moves, right? It opens and it closes. Uh, so that's it closed, that's it open, that's them building it, or being photographed building it, and that's it in the site. And, it, and it's lifted up so that the volunteers whose children are playing can see and they get the, kind of the best, the best view. Uh, you can see it in Grand Central. Sorry, this is a crap image. But this is um, a skate park plan, a series, what we call the skate trail coming together and making a kind of genius loci here so that the it's not a big blob of concrete. Got $25,000 from Tony Hawk from San Francisco, so it connects to the front edge, kind of um, 
here you go, this is better. So it's a series of sort of sidewalk size pores that are that size so that the students can build it themselves. They become expert in finishing concrete. We could help them pour it and they finished it. Um, so these are the sorts of renderings, not quite Columbia. But. And then these are, these are our client, um, the young local kids, which is a very different you know, client group than we've ever worked with before. This is the process of testing whether or not we could do this. Every concrete skateboard, con uh, and every skateboard contractor and concrete contractor said you can't do this. And conceptually, it's four inches of concrete that uses dirt to make its form work. So it's like putting a piece of paper down on the dirt and it folds up and down. And it's always just four inches. And so you make little things like that, which is a kind of a kick up. And so you're able to see the back of that piece of co that, that um, concrete pour. And this is them finishing the bowl. These three guys just became absolutely fantastic concrete finishers. And this is it opening. Uh, um, again, an, an amazing uh, bringing another client into the park. Uh, Corten steel grinding, whatever you call them, place the grind on. Um, So it, it disappears externally, it disappears, and then when you get into it, you find it. And at many places, you just see the kind of kids jumping. You don't actually understand what they're <laughs> jumping from, I suppose. And then also in the park, we're building a playground out of 2,800 galvanized steel barrels uh, that we like in agglomeration. Individually, they're not that pretty, but together they look pretty. So this is a mock-up. Uh, we, we're making a roof to, to, sh to shade the maze. We're making a 1,800 barrel maze for kids to run in and around. Swings, slides, all sorts of stuff. And this is a test to show the client what the hell we're talking about. That's the kind of shaded space that it makes underneath it. These are the images of it that it's gonna look like. So there's this big floating roof to provide shade. Um, and then all sorts of different things going on inside it. Uh, whoa, that's a spaceship. Can I go and play in it? And yeah, so, and then, then the ground falls away and makes so that maze runs out horizontally and the ground falls away and you have this kind of fantastic subterranean space as well. And then finally, um, this 20K thing. <laughs> finally. <laughs> uh, you know, um, it's, it's great for the studio because I think... Um, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to be very clear that we're not taking food off the table of the profession. Um, nobody else would enter into five years of designing a house for $20,000. No architect, no contractor, no builder could afford to do this. So each year we design a house, we build it, we let somebody live in it, we watch how they've lived in it. Um, it's, it's raised an awful lot of interest for whatever reason it's this sort of response to what is it to be affordable. You see all these trendy, affordable exclamations on the fronts of magazines, and it's $150,000. So um, we have given ourselves a discipline of, of $20,000, $12,500 in material, $7,500 in labor and profit, and you've got to build it in three weeks. And this is, uh, this is Dave's house that's in... That's in uh, in the exhibit, um, 10 foot high ceilings, screened in porch. He can run it for $35 a month. Um, and it's, you know, it ain't that sexy, but it is, uh, every piece of wood in there is thought about and talked about and pushed to its limit. Um, and the most recent one is uh, Max House. It's interesting that this one is a sort of a shotgun form, and I don't know how we've ended up like this, but they're very uh, um, historically relevant forms. You know, there were shotgun forms and there were dog trot forms, and I think it's this sort of, you know, you're working with a limited supply of material. This is the lumber you've got. How far can you span? Minimal foundations, yada, yada, yada. So here's the shotgun kitchen in the center, sleeps this side, lives that side. Uh, the porch is pushed in, and uh, so there's sort of two models floating around, and we're negotiating with Regions uh, Bank to, to begin to fund 
the next step of releasing these things so that they get built the way that we want them to be built. Um, finally, honestly finally, um, the studio also ethically has started to understand that we live in the middle of a forest in Alabama. We want to kind of release ourselves from Lowe's and Home Depot. Um, use, and, and one of the questions in the, in, the, in the forestry industry at the moment is what to do with, with the crappy trees. Because every 12, 10 to 15 years you have, to, you have to take these out so that the other ones grow nice and tall and straight. What can you do with those? At the moment they're used for paper pulp. They're also used for fence posts and they burn them. Um, no one's reading newspapers anymore. They're all sitting there with their laptops. So what can you do with this? And so we've challenged ourselves to take that material and think about uh, how, what, what particular forms and manners can we use it in. Our long-term aim is to use it in housing. We had an initial try that was, a, I, quite honestly, a failure. Ended up with a f ridiculously expensive joint. Then we started looking m much you know, more, um, I don't know what the word is. We looked at it in another way. <laughs> and, and, and you know, you cut this tree down and you bend it and it's because it's, it's new and wet and it's just been cut down, it bends more easily. So you tie it and make a beam. And so suddenly you've got a beam that used to be three or four inches and now it actually has a structural capability of that. And so this is sort of conceptual student diagram. Um, this is what they ended up with. We're working with the US Forestry Service, re, uh, using this material to rebuild some of the infrastructure in uh, uh, Oak Mulgee National Forest, which is part of the Talladega National Forest, with the idea that eventually we'll start to look enclosures, uh, enclosures and how to build small houses. This was the second one. Uh, stuff you don't need to know about. And then this is the one that's going on this year. It's a 180 foot long bridge made uh, with a lattice truss. The lattice is um, doweled together. This is, the, this is the regional engineer for the Forest Service looking at this. Uh, so this is a section, this is a, a 15 foot section of, of, another, of a, ri a full section that would be uh, 60 feet long. So it's three sections of 60 feet coming to a landing point, and the landing points are put in with helical anchors. And uh, this has been quite an e engineering <laughs> experience, quite honestly. This bottom cord, um, it's the, the wood is put into compression because this wood is really no good. In, you can't make the joints in tension. Um, so we figured out a way to put that bottom cord into compression using a, a hidden wood metal rod. I'm not very clear that that's particularly structurally honest, but what it does allow, if you have the wood in here, is it allows you to bring the, the webbing down into it. Um, and finally, one of the things that we enjoyed from these student exercises was we, we had enjoyed this sort of homogeneous uh, form that the, the students had called a, 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 a doghouse. And we were invited by the VNA to put an entry in for an, an exhibition in London against, I think, 16 other architects. And they chose our, uh, it was entitled Woodshed. And um, we proposed this uh, very simple form that would have an afterlife out in the forest. Uh, you can't see these images, but it was very important to us how to build it, how to make one joint, one material, make a shed. This is a mock-up of it. And what was nice about this was this was just me and the young faculty. So that this was taking that research and moving it forward without it being having to be a student thing. And this is it built almost under completion in the VNA, uh, uh, burnt on the exterior, um, very simple, same joint everywhere. What else to tell you? That's how the finish of it. Uh, kind of stolen light fixed idea from Sigurd Leverance. Um, and we, we end up back at Morissette. The, the studio is looking at itself right now and talking about where it gets its building material, but also about how it lives and how it acts day to day. So we've, we've started to establish a kitchen garden. We've just built ourselves a kitchen. Our intent is to turn this into a farm, uh, to feed ourselves better so that the, the, the food doesn't travel as far um, and be more healthy. And uh, that's what we all look like. Um, 
So I, I've probably blown my time by about 300%. So um, apologies, Andres. I, once you, you're supposed to say, shut, shut up. So, okay. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, it's like, there's an on-off switch, you know. The, the more you talk, the less I have to ask oh, questions. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, oh, so yeah. You, you answered already almost. Did, did I? Okay. All good. <laughs> so, so we just, can... Uh, maybe just a few questions from my side, and then we will open up to the, to the audience. Thank you so much. This was very... <laughs> very long. Very good, very <laughs> intense. <laughs> and... I think we got really a great overview about what what Bro Studio was and uh, especially what it is at the moment. And um, one thing that comes to my mind is like always when you're showing me all these projects is like how do you do you build in like with the students coming and going, coming and going? How do you build in a memory? How uh, how does this like go on? <laughs> I mean, are you the person like now to keep that memory and like to keep it going or like where where is this sort of memory in it <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, well I, I I was saying to Ben before um, the the I, I think w one one thing that we do which is a sort of a luxury um, we, we can't we don't have the finances or the university hasn't got the finances to hire more professors, but we're able to hire our very best um, finishing thesis students. So as part of that conversation about keeping these projects rolling, they, they certainly help. They, they become a, an arbitrator between me and the students. They help continue the energy in a project. They, they allow some of that, co that, com that collective memory to mm. be brought back onto the table but um, the truth of the matter is that I'm I at the moment have to be the glue for a lot of that and I, I, I don't I just it's a fact of the matter you know if you're going to do a project in Lions Park and it's gone on for six years I was there six years ago and, and they weren't so mm. Hol holding that together is is my job, and uh, I really enjoy designing that. I mean, I have to say, um, but it it um, what what's really super about it is to see confidence build locally, and trust build locally, that that we're worth working with, uh, you know, and we're able to as a as a kind of a neutral. Ar ar arm, if you're amateur, arbitrator. Um, we don't have any political stick. We're, we just want to work with people who are willing to try and do something and make the place a better place. And so essentially that's what we try and do. And, um, you know, I, we it's a very emotional situation because you can never know. Mm. I mean, I, you know, three days ago, the guy who's head of the Lions Park Committee called me up and he said, we've got a problem, Andrew. You know, and the problem came directly to me. It wasn't because it was, you know, we'd had on the drawing a walking trail for two years and we'd just poured the concrete for a walking trail and suddenly the people who do work on the rodeo arena said, that's exactly where our horses run out. You know, what are you doing? Our horses are going to run and fall over your frigging walking trail. And uh, it, it's that stuff that mm. is is very it makes it worthwhile if you can negotiate through it and and see that the people who are also leading the group buy into it and are supportive it's not like they panic they just said well you know this is this has been on the drawings for two years we've agreed as a group you know sorry there's nothing we mm. can do about this now how are we going to work out a way forward and so so um, I mean that uh, in 
in some respects, that's my job, is to be that liaison between incoming, outgoing students. There's the collective memory of the student body. We're not very good at archiving, but I think we're, ver we're pretty good at looking at what we've done and responding to it. Um, I mean, if you live in one place and you do this stuff and you're in a 25-mile radius, if you screw up, you get to hear about it. And so it's an amazing kind of, for uh, to be an architect, to look at how your work is aging, to be an educator, to be able to point out to the students. You know, at the beginning of every year, I take the studio on a tour and we talk about what we did okay and what we screwed up and why does it look like this and you know, you, we've got to learn from this. So you can't, you're not in a vacuum. So I don't know if I answered any of your question, but. Yeah, know. absolutely. And it, the other question is connected with it. Um, when we see like the first images, when you showed us how the, the neighborhood looks like with all this poverty around, uh, how do you choose the projects? I mean, there's so much you could do. Uh, I mean, there's so many people living in trailers and maybe even not anymore so much, but in shacks and things. So there's so much need. Um, and if you start with students, like, and they have to find a project, it's, it's a little bit connected with the, with, with the other question. Like, uh, who takes the decision, like, which project are we, we taking this year? <laughs> <laughs> well, the studio does. Um, we, um, we've been there for 18 years. All my staff are live locally, they're locals, um, so I get feedback mm. that I may or may not want. Um, we have been through a variety of ways of trying to find clients and, and appropriate people. At, so at various points we've used the social services and then you find out that the social service folks are, are sort of <coughs> competitively jousting to get their person as the client and so you don't get any truth when you go through that process. Um, so what we've done, or I've done, is I've started asking people that are going out there and just people like mail delivery people, people like furniture delivery people, uh, the guy that is the head of the local Alabama Power who knows whether or not people are struggling with paying their bills or if they're genuinely struggling or they're blowing their money on something else and then struggling. And so uh, it's, not, it's not a beautiful situation to play, play God, but we have, I think, enough feelers out there that we've started to make those choices ourselves. And I think you're never going to get, th always somebody's going to have skeletons in the closet. And, and you know, I, so we, we do a little bit of that. Um, um, but we're looking for people that, who want to be engaged in the dialogue. Um, I think we've moved. There's a discussion in the studio about the single family house at the moment because clearly doing one house a year isn't helping anybody, probably not even that family. But if we can, uh, this week, there's one of those 20K houses has been built by a local contractor to test in baby steps, the way to take the 20K house forward. Can a local guy who thinks he knows how to build in stick frame, can he build ours and how close can he get and how quickly can he build it? And he, he, he delighted me because he came to me first of all and he said, you know, what I like about this is that we can bring some money into the local economy. It's like a cottage industry. The local guys build it, you employ local guys if you build 16 of these a year, you bring $327,000 $320, into the economy. You're hiring two people at above the medium income, and this guy's making 65 to 70,000. That just about makes him a millionaire locally. So, can, uh, and he said, "I love these." I said, "I want these to, you know, we can do these because I want my grandparents living in these. I want my family living in these, and I want to imagine how we can make them in an aggregation." And I, you know, I got goosebumps when he said this. And you know, predictably, he's turned out to be a disaster. <laughs> but um, uh, it's the first step. And I think um, we we can I I think we can have some impact with this simply because 
really nobody else can afford to do it. I mean, you all could. You all could try one. Um, I don't know how easily you could test one, but we have the ability to, to design it, build it, and be living right next to them, watching how much they're using the heating and you know how much they're using the cross ventilation in the windows and all of that stuff. So, I I uh, I hope that we can become more relevant. I mean, I, I it's nice to make some interesting little houses that everyone delights in. They bring delight, but I think the twenty thousand dollar house and these these models could really have some impact, not only from living conditions, but from the point of view of bringing some money to the economy. So now, this is exactly the, the reason why I choose this project for the exhibition, because I think it has a, like this, the impact is not only like local, but it can really <coughs> reach out and in, in far out like on this specific condition where you're working on. I think we have not so much time anymore left, so um, I would like to open it now question and answers from the from the audience. Please take a microphone when you uh, uh, speak up. Yes. Okay, let's start here. The first question. Hello, uh, my name is Abdel. I guess my question refers to the transferability of the knowledge that's learned at the rural studio. Now, I'll give like a uh, hypothetical situation. Like someone like me would go there, be a student for five years from New York, and then get the knowledge there, and then come back to New York. And then my question is, then what? Because mm -hmm. it seems like the rural of part of the rural studio is such a big part of it. So I'm just curious yeah. if you have any examples of people doing that, or what you would imagine would happen if it hasn't happened, or something along that line. Second question up there. Um, I was wondering, uh, you were talking about how some of the houses were based on, I guess, the dog trot house. Um, did y'all study, um, I guess, any of the local houses for sort of like design ideas as far as like, you said cross ventilation, like how that works um, for the new designs? And the third question? Um, this one in the back here. Thanks for lecturing. I was wondering if you could give us your perspective on the employment of unpaid interns while in school and out of school, um, especially in terms of their both firms that uh, can't afford to pay and interns that uh, can't afford to work for free. Um, and this is perhaps with the lens of the AIA's uh, perspective on it and maybe an international perspective. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> you have the right not to answer the question. <laughs> All right, can I take the fifth? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, remind me what yours was. <laughs> mm. If you come back to New York after working yeah. for the studio. Well, um, I, I you, know, you know, as I said at the beginning, I don't think that I'm suggesting there should be a rural studio everywhere. Um, but I, I do, I hope, think that the students walk away um, w w without the kind of fear that I had when I left school, that, that they can have a little bit more control over their future and the way they decide to lead their lives as either human beings or as architects. Um, I don't know that we can necessarily be blamed if there are not that many opportunities to do similar work. I mean, I don't know, is it is it a societal problem? There seems to be a desire to do this kind of work. Um, the um, transferability, I mean, I, I that there are, and, and I don't know if, if this is necessarily answering your question, but there are, um, there are opportunities out there um, if you've got the time and the imagination. Um, Steve Bedanes, for example, in Washington, um, does work on the periphery um, um, that nobody else would do. And he, he has got himself in a position there where he can w n negotiate with the local authorities and contractors and developers 
and, and make things happen in particularly non-for-profit situations that, that benefits everybody. It benefits the people involved like you and I, but it also be ben benefits clearly the recipient, whether it's school kids that have a better yard to play in or whatever it is. Um, so I, I think there are models out there. I mean, I, I live in a, um, I live in an environment, and you know, there's there's so much to say about this situation, um, and it's relevant to this question as well. That you know, uh, that there's no money to police the building permit process in Hale County, right? We work to the Southern Building Code. We either work to the Southern Building Code or the Universal Building Code, right? Um, but if we make drawings, there's nobody to present them to. And that's, that's, that's not our fault, but I think that we take on a moral obligation to make, you know, we, we don't, they, not, they don't become like the building code becomes the design criteria. You don't have something to fall back on. If you decide not to put a handrail in, you've made that choice. And so we work very hard on those choices. But, um, so, so it, it on some aspects, it is easy for us to do this, and it is easy to fit more easy to fit it into a, an academic situation because there isn't this sort of we're look, we want to look at these drawings, but we we make them, and we have contractors that we have consultants that work with us that are engineering all of our projects to 100 mile an hour winds and making sure that we hope that none of that will happen. Um, we also have an architect of record on the projects. Um, now, um, I, I don't. I sorry. I I've spoken too much tonight, and I, I, I could go on and on about getting into this question. Uh, as as to the the unpaid uh, interns, I mean, I, I um, it 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 disappoints me that 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 there are. And you know maybe it's maybe you can say that I'm being a hypocrite, um, but it, it disappoints me that that there are upstanding architects out there who are essentially exploiting interns. And I don't think if we don't respect ourselves, who the hell will, right? That's that is all really all I can say about that. Now I. I hope that what we're doing is actually showing people that design has value. So I'm not, I don't think that, I hope that I'm not exploiting, or we're not exploiting our students. I think that one of the interesting things is that actually we've started to put very real values on our time and work it in so that our local folks know what the hell they're getting. Because, you know, money talks, right? This is what it would cost you in the real world, Joel. Do you understand this? So, uh, but, uh, but I think there is an, there's an exchange that takes place that's so valuable that I, I don't, I don't want I, I to feel like a hypocrite. But because um, I, I feel that we're, I hope that we're helping educate folks to respect design as being of value, right? And that might be condescending. I don't know. I mean, I don't think we do it overtly. You know, we are important. You know, but I, I we find we try to scratch design out of very little. And again, um, <laughs> I'm always having to look at a project and go, well, can this project exist without us? Because I I don't want to take food off the table of the profession. I also don't want to f take food off the table of local contractors. So if I can hire a local contractor to do part of it, fantastic. And that's what we do. Um, and you, you know, ethically and morally, it's it's a really it's it's a fine line. It's a fantastic discussion. I mean, I I don't know if we should be doing it, but I, I as I say, our first question is, can this happen without us? And and that's really the first sort of check on the list is well, mm, if it can't, well then we'll have a go at it. But it's hard to, you know, I, I know the local AIA were up in arms about the fire station. The fire station just got an award. 
for the best new or the best you know public building in alabama for the last ten years <laughs> and it was a group that works with the aia and it was funny because I, kn I knew that they weren't i was wondering what was going to happen when <laughs> when suddenly four young people get up at the front and receive the award because it wasn't it wasn't the it was just an it was an odd moment right and and i so i'm very i i don't want to compete with the profession i i uh i think if the profession is interested in what we do and interested in the discussion about it and how is it that these folks when they're 24 years old can make this i'm interested in talking about that i mean because some of it's pretty good you know so <laughs> uh God, I don't know. I mean, sorry, I didn't answer your question at all. <laughs> so I want to say thank you again. Thank you so much for coming, and this was really very, very important. Thanks for listening. Thank you. <laughs>